very blessed Sunday morning worship service that we just came through and and I think the Lord uh, uh, some of us may have reached out and trust the Lord and some of us must have not felt anything there are always two groups of people some of us say that oh yes I was blessed <coughs> some of us say oh I, I couldn't feel anything uh, it's the same it's the same song that melts the wax and hardens the clay uh, there's nothing wrong with the sun, but it's what we are made up of. If the Lord has taken out our stony heart and given us a heart of flesh, that heart will always want to long after God. Uh, as a heart, <coughs> not the not this heart, H-A-R-T, as a deer panting after the water brooks, <coughs> so does my soul pant after thee, O oh God. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart, and he always longed <coughs> to be in the presence of God. Uh, he always longed to be in the temple. He always longed uh, to uh, and waited on God to give him a song. He waited on God to give him a word. He waited on God not just to worship him. <clears throat> not just to... David was a worshipper. David was a worshipper. There was no worshipper in Israel as David. He was a worshipper. But above all, he waited on God to hear God's word. That's why he could write those psalms. He could... Those psalms still bless us <coughs> after 3,000 years, <coughs> 2,500 years, something years. Those psalms are still a blessing. Those songs are still sung in Israel. Those songs are still sung in, in the body of Christ. Those psalms, <coughs> the songs are a blessing to each and every generation. Because David waited on God. He said, I waited patiently. And the Lord inclined his ears unto me. But while he was waiting, he also knew the scripture which said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the word of mouth of God shall man live. And David waited on God not just to speak. Uh, for, for, for David just didn't speak to the Lord in prayer, but David waited on God to speak to his heart. God spoke to David and that's why David was encouraged. The, way, the only reason David could encourage himself in the Lord was to was to speak the word of God to himself. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing, if only I could put this right, it's amazing that how many people come and come in the worship service, lift up their hands, you can even find tears rolling down their cheeks, and, uh, and they go back refreshed. They go back refreshed, but they are not changed. Think about it. Think about it. It's important. I'm not saying worship is not important. Prayer is not important. It touches our emotions. Those words touch our hearts when we sing. And, and we feel emotional. Uh, some of us, there's no emotion at all. We feel emotional. Those, those words give us, give us goosebumps. And uh, we really spend time praising, worshipping. But uh, I would like to like to uh, uh, get one <coughs> or, or align myself with, the, uh, myself with the writer of the Hebrews which said that the word of God is alive and fresh and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. The worship service, the music touches our soul. <coughs> the word of God divides between the soul and the spirit. It goes deep. And the change in our life comes through the word of God. And we need to pray that God let your word change me. Jesus said, now you are clean because of the words that I have spoken unto you. Jesus spoke words that could wash the disciples. And the true body of Christ even today speaks words that cleanses the sheep. That washes our, 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 our dirty, filthy uh, spirit is the word that reaches down to the spirit. We need. That's why Jesus said, the, "A time shall come, and now is the true worshippers shall worship the Lord not just in the spirit, but spirit and truth. Truth is very important. That's why we spend so many hours giving you the word of God. If only." 
if only since we don't uh, if, 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 if only we just go and meditate on the word david said on his law that he meditate day and night and that cleanses him from inside that that not just refreshes us the word of god not just refreshes us the word of god cleanses us it helps us it encourages us it helps us to stand during the storm it helps us to act like jesus when we are going through the darkest time of our life it doesn't it doesn't make us to sit and sit and ponder on the negatives it makes us to sit and ponder on the way and the life of christ it's very important that we are not just refreshed in the worship service but we are changed when we come to church change me oh god from the creature that i am uh, can you help me with the song uh, renew my life by the washing of the word word is important saints change me oh god from the creature that i am renew my mind by the washing of the word restore my soul to you don't leave me as i am don't leave me as i am lord help me to change Help me to change, O oh God. Amen. Help me to change, change into water. Devil, no, change me like into the, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are some people that change; they become more like the devil. There are some people that change and become more like Christ. We need to become a little more like Christ today when we leave this church. Not just refreshed in our soul. We need that. We need the refreshing. We need the. <coughs> excuse me. the water of the holy ghost to wash us and just fall upon us and refresh our uh, thirsty and uh, thirsty heart we need that saints i'm not denying it but above all we need the the that two edged sword to get deep down to the marrow and show us ourselves and change us from inside out because we need to understand that we are not mistakers in need of correction we are sinners in need of a savior get that down right in your heart man did man did commit a mistake in the garden man committed sin in the garden it was not a mistake by adam and eve it was sin and we are not mistakers in need of correction we are sinners in need of a savior we are all sinners saved by grace we are still being saved we were saved once upon a time we are being saved today we will be saved tomorrow we don't get better because of our works we get better because of the work that jesus did for us the only thing that we deserved was nothing but condemnation and death and disgrace but god justified us he gave us life and he bestowed grace upon our lives Paul talks about this to the Romans here in Romans and chapter three. <clears throat> here in the book of Romans and chapter three, verse twenty-three, he says, "For all have sinned, uh, no exception. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God." Let's read from uh, let's, let's let's read verse ten. He says, "As it is written, there is none righteous." No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. When it says none, no one, all, it means we all are included in this. We all are included in this. Uh, then it goes their throat and all those things. Uh, let's come to verse twenty. Uh, twenty. 23 uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely we didn't do anything for our justification god gave gave that gift of the holy spirit to us and we were justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom god had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of god He says to us, twenty-six, to declare, I say at this time his righteousness, that he might be just. There's only one just, and that is God. God is the just, 
God is just and the justifier. We are the ones who have been justified. God is the justifier. We are justified. God is the only just God and the justifier of his children. And he says to declare, I say at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. And verse 27 says, where is boasting then? Come on, Paul tells me, now tell me what did you do? Paul tell me, where is your boasting? Tell me what all sacrifices you did now. Come on. We, we glory so much in our sacrifices. We glory so much in our works. We glory something we did 50 years ago only once. And we keep mentioning it. We glory. If Let me tell you, ask you all, including me, a question. Who is the person sitting? I'm not comparing you to Jesus today. Let me ask you all a question. Who is a person sitting here that's done more for God than Paul? Anyone? No? Forget Jesus. Who's equivalent to Paul in his life, in his suffering, in his sacrifices? And Paul, that man is telling you, why, do you, why are you boasting? Boasting for what? Boasting for what? What have you done that makes you boast every day? That makes you put your spouse down? That makes you think that you are better than your husband or your wife? Or your pastor or your church? Or your brothers or your sisters? With boasting also comes blaming. The person who boasts is the person who blames. Boasting and blaming go hand in hand. A person who is humble and never boasts will never blame anyone. Are you getting what I am saying? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> A person who is boasting will always keep blaming. Things, people, situations, conditions. Boss, employees, colleagues, whoever. Because it's not them, it's the other person. Paul says, where is boasting that it is, it is excluded? By, a, by what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. And just as Paul is asking a question, where is boasting? Let me ask you one more question. Where is blaming then? Blaming is as worse as boasting. Blaming is one of the few first first things that Adam and Eve did, right? Adam, what did Adam say? He blamed his wife and blamed God. It's not me, God. It's the wife that you gave me. That is your wife that you gave me. The wife said, it's not me, God. It's the serpent. It's the devil. Sin doesn't bring just boasting. Sin also brings blaming. And this is all, this is still going on, and we found this, we find this in every seed of Adam. Since our lives will be better, our lives will be blessed if we stop blaming anyone. Stop blaming your spouse for what you're going through. What you're going through is because of you, not because of your spouse. What you are going through is because you need it, not your spouse. Why blame people? Why blame people? If only we humble ourselves, saints, that will just go. If we only humble and surrender ourselves to God, you will see God changing situations. Only God can change our situation things. I'm telling you, in each and every one of our lives, there's a situation today. In every life, there's a situation that no one can change. No one. It's just in your hands and God's hands. It's between you and God. 
and what is hindering you to go to God is a spirit of blaming. Stop blaming. Start surrendering. Amen. God will come down where you are. He'll come down where you are, saints. God comes to the humble person wherever he or she is. In whichever pit he or she is. Every trial, every test Joseph went through made him humbler and humbler and humbler. And you read the life of Joseph, there was no boasting nor complaining. And God lifted him up. God reached in the pit where he was. God reached in the prison where he was. God reached in the palace where he was. Wherever Joseph was, God was with him. Because he was not a man who boasted and complained and blamed. Let me tell you something about blaming. When we blame others, we give up the power to change. A person who blames can never change. A person who accepts the condition of their heart is the first person to change. Sometimes you have to accept blame that is not even right. Jesus did that. Paul did that. The apostles did that. It's very hard sometimes to accept the blame which is right. To accept the sin which we see and is right. I'm, not, I'm talking about that today. But, you, but going forward, a higher level of maturity is when you accept things spoken about you which is not even right. And you don't even blame anyone for that. That's a higher level of maturity. What glory it is when you are buffeted for your own faults and you take it quietly. But you know what is glorious? Is when you are not in fault and you are buffeted and you, uh, you still accept it. And the scripture says that is acceptable in the sight of God. When we keep blaming, 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 we can never change. Because we need to understand we are sinners, we are not victims. Victims blame, sinners repent. We are not victims of the situation, we are not victims of people, we are not victims. God will never make you a victim of anyone. God's children are never victims. God doesn't work on victims, God works on sinners. Because victims keep justifying and blaming sinners to repent and change. Paul said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The, we need to understand the attitude of blame is very dangerous. Because the person who's at fault, who's blaming, everyone can, it is evident to everyone that they are the ones who are at fault. But that person himself or herself doesn't know that he that he is at fault. Their fault is evident to everybody, but except themselves. And and and, and here David <coughs> writes a tremendous psalm in Psalms 139. This psalm, I can see, is a New Testament psalm. It wasn't possible for all in the Old Testament to, to live the way David, David wrote in this, in, this, in this chapter. That's why I believe David was so close to God. See, it's not an, and see, as I told in the beginning, it's not, it's not, you don't come here to meet the band when they play a song. You come here to meet Jesus, about whom the songs are played. You come to meet the band and the songs, you'll just be emotionally stirred. You come to meet Jesus, you'll go back changed. That's why Christian, there's someone said, Christianity is not coming to a place. Christianity is coming to a person. Christianity is when you meet Jesus 
when your will crosses the will of God and your will backs off and God's will takes over, that's Christianity. Every day our will and God's will cross. Who wins? Who wins? Psalm 139. <clears throat> And he says, verse 1 onwards, Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. David says, I don't care what people think about me. God, you've searched my heart. You've known me. You've known me. You know my, my down-sitting, my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar. Or before even those thoughts could come in my mind, Lord, you know what I'm going to think tomorrow. You know it. And then he goes on, he says, verse 7 and 8, Where shall I flee away from thy presence? Wherever, if I go up to heaven, go down in the pit, wherever I am, you are, you are there. You are there. And he says, he says, <coughs> he says in verse 23, I don't have to go through the whole psalm, it will take a long time. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. <coughs> Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So see if there be any wicked or hurtful way in me. Because of that wicked and hurtful way doesn't just hurt me, it hurts people that come in touch with me. It hurts people that come in contact with me. Our heart is the only heart that we can deal with. Keep that in mind. Don't try to change someone else's heart. You'll never be able to. Ask the husbands and the wives. They've been living with them. Today is someone's anniversary. They've been living for 33. Some of one couple's living for 33 years. The other couple's living together for 47 years. No one's able to change anyone. No one was. No spouse was able to change their their spouse. Right? Yes or no? The only heart that's in control is my heart. No matter you keep your spouse bound in chains for 10 years, he'll never change. No matter you keep your spouse night and day, she'll never change. No matter how, 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 whatever whip or hunter you take and keep whipping and hunt and then beating your spouse, they'll never change. Because in my hands is only my heart that I can change. And if I change, my change can work as a positive on my spouse's heart. The unbelieving spouse is saved by the believing spouse. Not by the nagging spouse. Not by a complaining spouse. Not by a groaning spouse. By a believing spouse by their chaste conduct and conversation my spouse can be changed my wife can be changed but my heart is in my control <clears throat> we can change no one but only ourselves and you know what keeps us from changing the attitude of blaming david here has an attitude of self examination you know why? Because he had a relationship with God. He had a one-to-one -one relationship with God. And David did, doesn't say, search them, O God. And search their heart. Try them and know their thoughts. See, God, there are so many wicked ways in them. Have mercy on them, O God. And lead them on the right path, O God. Does David pray like that? It's not them. He, she, they, it's me. Everyone say me. me. Say again. Me. It's me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart, O oh God. Try me, O oh God. And know my thoughts, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me, O oh God. And lead me on the way everlasting. What a prayer. What a prayer. David replaces you with me. 
And it takes humility to pray this prayer. We may say it, we may sing songs about it, but the day we start meaning this, that day will change everything in our life. Let's mean what we say and let's say what we mean. It takes humility to self-examine. Therefore, let a man examine himself. Himself. It takes humility. Pride is a veil that's between me and self-examination. Humility tears that veil between me and self-examination. It takes humility to resolve a conflict. It takes humility to make relationships sweet. And humility always starts with me first. Me first, Lord. I want to look inside of me first. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. And try me and know my thoughts. Let's all read verse 23 together. In whichever Bible uh, language you're, 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 you, have, you brought here. Let's read verse 23 and verse 24 together. Let's mean it when we read it. Let's read. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Underline the words me and mine. I think it's about six times here. In two verses, six times David points to himself. In six years, we don't point to ourselves even once. And in ten seconds, David points to himself six times. Six times. See how introspective these verses are. David is saying, look at yourself. Look at what you've done. Look at your responsibility, your impatience, your wickedness. David says, look at that. Not them, him, her, it, wife, children, church, employees, colleagues, neighbors. Stop looking at people around. Let's start looking at ourselves. Change has to start with me. Change has to start with me. There's a difference between humility and sympathy. I may have sympathy for myself, that's not humility. Sympathy oftentimes is pride covered. <coughs> pride covered with low thoughts about oneself. That is what sympathy is. Pride covered with low thoughts about one's self. That is sympathy. Humility is you come to God the way you are. And accept the, whoever you are, whatever you did. That's humility. Because sin in me has to be dealt with. And that's why God's given us a church, He's given us the Bible. Has given us the Holy Spirit. Not to molecular sin. Sin has to be dealt with because if sin lies unchecked in me, it's very dangerous. Sin, when it lies unchecked and not dealt with, becomes very dangerous because sin never remains constant. Sin always grows. That's why sin is always, uh, uh, always in the scripture, it, it, it is related to cancer. You leave cancer unattended, it will grow. And sin is that thing. Sin is like a weed. You don't have to plant seeds of weed in your field. Tell me one farmer which plants seeds of weed in their field. No one. You just leave your, the field the way it is, weeds will grow. Right? You don't have to do anything. The only way to grow weeds in your land is to leave your land unattended. The only way to grow in sin is to leave that sin unattended. Don't deal with that. But when you start dealing with sin, it hurts. But it, it, it then afterwards yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. 
in whom it is exercised thereby. Let me tell you a small story about David and Saul. And let's see, let's see, let's see Saul's life, Saul's life here and David's life. We all see here in 1 Samuel, the chapter 16, that, they, that David is anointed by Saul. <clears throat> Let me quickly go through the scriptures, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16 and verse 13. Then Samuel took a horn of, horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day onward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now when the scripture says evil spirit from the Lord, it doesn't mean the Lord has a bank in which he stored all the evil spirits. No, it means that the Lord permitted, the Lord gave permission to an evil spirit to come and take a hold of Saul. Sometimes the Lord permits demons to come and test us and try us. So here, <coughs> God permitted, I'm sorry, an evil spirit to trouble Saul. So, so we see in verse 13, the spirit of the Lord comes on David and verse 14, the spirit of the Lord goes off from Saul. So here is Saul's anointing, uh, sorry, David's anointing and God puts David in the palace before the king uh, now to play worship songs. If you read it further, Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now an evil spirit from the Lord troubled you. So they say, I, we know a man, <clears throat> we know a man, we know a young boy, was 18, uh, a Bethlehemite, the son of Jesse, that is very cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man, a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person and the Lord is with him. So they said, we know a person who can play songs. See, uh, we know a person who can play and harp very, very, very uh, skillfully. <coughs> I think that was not the answer. The answer was not hearing songs. The answer for Saul was to humble himself and to surrender to the Lord. And, and we keep reading here, and Saul sent messengers, verse 19, to Jesse, and said, send me the, David thy son, which is, with, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey, laden, laden with bread, and bottle of wine, and, and a kid, and, and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David comes now. <clears throat> David comes and starts playing, uh, playing the harp, and it came to pass, verse 23, when the evil spirit was God upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Thank God for this word, refreshed here. I didn't, I didn't know it earlier when I, in the beginning, I was making a statement that we can be refreshed in the worship service, but not changed. Saul was refreshed but not change. Thank God for that verse. They just made, made, made it easy to prove my point, right? We can be refreshed when the band plays a number, but we can never be changed. This changes my life. And the only way it can change my life is when I surrender to the word of God. Amen. It's not my word of God. It's not my will of God. It's your word. Your will, your way, your time. And Saul was refreshed and was well. For that particular moment, he is well. When we pray for some people which are possessed, for some time they are well. But, but they don't fill themselves with the word of God. And because they are empty, the demons come back. And this time not alone, but with seven powerful demons. So it's very important that when we are refreshed in the spirit, let's fill ourselves with the word of God. Let's fill ourselves with the word of God. Let's not be empty. Otherwise, the, the demons will come back. And here now Saul is refreshed. And when David plays his harp, and he is refreshed but not changed. And days later, we, know, we see in the next chapter, uh, chapter 17, that David slays Goliath now. And in verse, in chapter 18, <coughs> when David comes back, uh, he comes back here in verse, chapter 18 and verse 7, it says, And the women answered one, one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, now, now people are praising David more than Saul. And something now changes again in Saul's spirit. 
And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, uh, and he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Now, now, now something changes. But where? Does David change? Did God change? Did David's harp change? Did David's music change? What changed? Saul's spirit changed. And what did Saul do? Started blaming David for his fall. And now it came to pass on the morrow, verse 10, an evil spirit from, the, from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house and David now, now, now same, the same evil spirit, <clears throat> the same house, the same David, the same music, the same heart. But it says, now Saul had a javelin in his, in his hand. A javelin. And Saul cast the javelin for his hand. I will smite David even unto the wall and David avoided out of his presence. Now David was playing the heart as usual. But Saul, instead of shutting his eyes and surrendering his life, had thoughts of blame in his heart against David. When we sit here with thoughts of animosity and grudge and blame, we'll never go back changed. We'll have a javelin in our hands always. There are many people sit in church with javelin in their hands. Let's throw it all. And says, God, I don't want anything. I want your armor. The armor of God doesn't have a javelin. The armor of God has a shield of faith. There is no javelin in Ephesians 6. Saul was not refreshed anymore. Even the refreshing stopped now. The same church, the same music, the same band, the same, same choruses, but Saul was not, not even refreshed anymore. Now he has a spear in his hand because something changed in his heart. Not David, not the song, not the heart. It was Saul who was changed for the worse. And he needed to look within. He needed to search his own heart. He needed to ask God to try him and try his ways and see if there be any wicked way in him. He needed to do that, but he starts blaming David for his downfall. He starts to blame David for his spiritual decline. He starts to blame David, the person anointed by God for his spiritual decline. The worship and preaching don't help me anymore in that church. Saul said, this, this boy and his heart doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help me now. I want another boy, another heart. Let's go to another church. Let's go to another, let's hear some other preacher. Let's go to another, let me marry again, another spouse. Let me change my job. Let me do this, let me do this, let me do this. But I won't do anything in my spirit. I won't change myself. I won't search my own ways. As I said, saints, sin can never stay dormant. When sin left to itself, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse by the day. Sin incubates, they say. Sin incubates in darkness. Incubates means sin grows. Like you keep that baby, uh, 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 a baby who is prematurely born. Where do you keep that baby? In an incubator. Why? Because it needs to grow still. The same way when we don't bring out our sin in the open, when we don't surrender, when we don't accept our fault and accept our sin and keep that sin in darkness, it incubates in darkness. That keeps growing and growing and growing and it turns into iniquity. And it turns into a great transgression. That's why they say, nip it in the bud. Nip it there itself. Nip it there itself. Then there comes a time where we are no longer blessed in the church. We are no longer blessed 
in the in the worship service we are no longer blessed by the message then there is problem with 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 the band with the songs with the message with the preaching there's problem with everyone but me because we have left something unattended unchecked in our spirits and sin always gets worse when it's left alone aw tozer said that the bias of nature is towards the wilderness and not a fruitful garden that's the law of entropy the law of entropy says that whatever was in order is going to chaos you leave your cupboard you make your cupboard one day and start using your cupboard after 10 days you'll see your cupboard is going to chaos right you have to again restructure some clothes keep some things nicely because the tendency of not just nature a tendency of a, even a human being is not to become fruitful at automatically if we leave ourselves to ourselves we will become a wilderness that's why we need help of the spirit of god to turn our wilderness into a fruitful garden we need god we need his spirit we need his word we need his help and we need the soil of humility to bear the fruit flowers of christ the so- humility is the soil in which the fruit of the spirit grows that's why in the fruit of the spirit there is no humility check it's love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self control there's no humility you know why humility is the heart humility is the soil in which this fruit grow if we are not humble we will not even bear the fruit of the spirit you see that in scripture right from cain right from cain the blame game had already started it's, it's able because of able god didn't accept my sacrifice what able it's you cain it's you it's me i'm going through what i'm going through is because of me my heart my wickedness it's me i can't blame anyone for the situation that i am in today and i have learned that and i am still learning i am not sitting up on the mountain and talking to you down in the valley i am in the valley with you don't think i am up on the mountain and i don't know what you are going through come on saints we are in this together I don't want to go alone. I want you with me. I want to be all to come to a higher level of spiritual growth. This church has a potential. This is a good church. That's why it's here for so many years. Otherwise, this church would have been attacked. Was attacked by the devil so many times. It would have been closed by now. But this is a good congregation. This is a good church. These are good families. These are good godly people that are just deceived by a few things by the devil. And I'm trying to weed those things out today. Don't take me as your enemy. I'm the only best friend you can ever have here today. Hallelujah. A friend stick it closer at all times. I stay with you at all times. I won't just tell you things and walk off. I'll be with you. If only you can understand the heart. There was a man called Job, isn't it? A man called Job. I don't want to go any further. I don't know. I don't want you to think that I am pressing it in. I'm not pressing it in. it's been pressed in in me there's a man called job what did he do for 30 35 chapters what did he do tell me huh blame 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 and blame god 
He said, he, give me the scripture somewhere in Job. That's why I don't go to it. I don't go to places because then it comes back. He says that, God, do you even have a right to search me? <laughs> he asks God. Look at the word search me in Job. God, you think you can search me? And what did David say? Search me, O God. And what does Job say? You searching me? I don't want really, to really sit down without that scripture. Let me open my Bible. I have surely underlined it. <coughs> this is, I'm sorry. In the beginning, when Job starts talking, in one of the first few chapters, 8 8, let's check. For inquire, I pray thee of the formal age and prepare. No, no, the word search. And it's a question that Job, uh, Job asks. Yes? 39. Job 13 and verse 9. It, it is good that he should, is it? Yes. Is it good that he should search you or no? This is, this is who speaking? Is it Job? Just a minute. Yes, this is Job, but he's talking about you. Is it good that he search? So he should search you out, or as a man mocketh another, so do you mock him? Uh, yes, it's in chapter ten. Let's all turn to Job chapter ten. He says in verse one, "My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint up on myself." Now see this man full of sympathy for himself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Verse 2. I will say unto God, Doth not, Do not condemn me. Look at this man. Do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou condemn. Why, why are you contending with me? Why? Now he's asking God a question. Why are you against me? Why are you uh, contending against me? Look at this man. Look at the blame game here. So it, 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 verse 3. It, is it good unto thee that thou should, thou should oppress me? That thou should despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked. There are wicked people, God, that you don't deal with them. But me? Me? You're after me? Verse 2. Do you have eyes of flesh? Look at this man. Look at this man. You Do you have eyes of flesh or seest thou as man sees? Are thy days as days of man, and thy years as man's days? Verse 6. That thou inquire, inquirest after my iniquity, and searchest after my sin. You are searching my sin, God? You are searching my sin? The man who did so much, the man who gave so much, the man who helped so much, the man who whatever. You are searching my sin, O oh God. Look at the blame. The same man in chapter 42 says, Now I'll shut my mouth. The same man that talked and talked and talked and talked with boys. God should have given him a boil on his tongue. At least he should have stopped talking. But tongue was the only organ left that didn't have voice. And he spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke. But a time came. I said, I only heard it by the hearing of my ear. But now my eyes see it. Lord, I repent, Job said, in dust and ashes. He said, I abhor myself. I abhor myself. When was the last time you said, Lord, I abhor myself? Paul, the great apostle, said, Who can deliver me from this body of sin? Look at that man. Did so much for God, suffered so much for God, and yet said, Who can deliver me? Sin still works in me, Paul said. And we think we are not sinners. Nothing works from us. Nothing happens with from us. 
And we're becoming like Job that tell God, are you searching my sin of God? Searching my sin. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Let's not give up the power to change. Let's all accept the blame. Accept that. Accept the, our sin the way it is. Because God has a way of working out humility in our lives. I'm telling you. You may think you're humble. You're not. I'm sorry. I, I used to think a lot that I'm humble. I'm humble. I'm a lot. I'm very humble. But you know what? I was in the gutter. And when I came out of the gutter, I still thought I was in the gutter. Because it was stinking. The stink was not of the gutter now, the stink was all the dirt that was attached to me. Saints, it's not, someone else is not stinking. My spirit is stinking, there's still dirt attached to me. He's lift, God has lifted us up from the dunghill, yes, but now he has to wash us. When he lifts us up from the dunghill, we come to the dung. And once he washes us white as snow, then we smell like Christ. It takes a lot of experiences. It takes a lot of valleys. It takes a lot of beatings from God. It takes a lot of washing by his word to get the dung out of our lives. And to smell like Jesus smelled. Thank God for a church. Thank God for a Sunday morning service. Everybody said, Amen. 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 These words are true. These words are true. God is true. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He never goes back on his words. No. You may think, oh, it's 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 contrary, it's not right, it's not right, it's not it may be not right. But God wants to work something in your life. It's not, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. And my prayer is the Lord will help each and every one of us here to have the mind of Christ and the spirit of Christ. Thank God for our Sunday morning service. Thank God for His church. Let's continue to pray for one another. Let's continue to pray for the church. Let's continue to pray for the saints of God. Let's continue to ask the Lord. Let's not despise praying for other saints. Let's pray for the saints of God. There are so many saints that need prayers. So many of us need prayers. Let's pray. Let's take the names of people. The names of our brothers and sisters when we pray. Let's pray for them. Pray. When we pray for people, it means that you love them. You'll never be able to pray for a person you don't love. You won't even take their name in your mouth. You won't even take their name in your mouth when you pray. Only the, only the poor people that you love, and saying these are people that we love, and love us. We need to pray for everyone that's in the church. Don't judge people, that's between God and them. We need to love and pray. For one another and ask God to strengthen each and every family, each and every brother and sister as they're going through their struggles and as they're going through their valleys, that God you be with them. Let your rod and your staff comfort them, O oh God. Help them, O oh Savior. And this church will be a wonderful church. So I bring you greetings once again to Brother Mr. Senji that they have they remembered you, praying for you, they've asked to pray for them their unspoken request. Let's continue to remember their, 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 their need in our prayers. And let's pray for all the saints of God here tonight, today. The ones that are not here, let's pray for each and every one of them also. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you.